on this Thursday night, taking a message to Ottawa. We got natural gas, we got oil, we're selling it for nothing. They're on the road in a convoy packed with anxiety and anger. We hitched a ride for part of the journey. What worries me is more the panic. Um, he, my dad doesn't usually panic. Violent anti-government protests in Haiti fuel concern from loved ones in Canada. Why some are criticizing Ottawa's response. It was very good company, the best that I worked with. And how the SNC-Lavalin story is playing in Quebec, plus documenting the company's hard sell to the government. At issue looks at the risks to the Liberal brand in an election year. This is the next. For days now, one unanswered question has lurked in the SNC-Lavalin story. Who exactly said what precisely to former Attorney General Jody Wilson-Raybould? And did it, in fact, amount to pressure from the PMO to treat the Quebec-based company lightly? Tonight, we're taking on two other questions. Canadians may be asking, how aggressively did SNC lobby for the legal change that would allow them a plea deal? And over what period of time? Public documents are revealing, and David Cochran spent the day analyzing the story they tell. The Trudeau government was just four months old when SNC-Lavalin came knocking. Bribery and corruption charges from its work in Libya threatened the company's very existence. We've lost out on uh, a number of contracts, probably in excess of uh, $5 billion. So in February 2016, the company met with François-Philippe Champagne, a Quebec MP who at the time was parliamentary secretary to the finance minister. It's the first recorded meeting to lobby for changes to Canadian law. From there, SNC-Lavalin lobbied up the Ottawa power chain, meeting with top staff for key ministers or the ministers themselves. By 2017, the effort widened. More departments, more ministers, even Canada's ambassador to the U.S. Going to the PMO to seek political support to allow for a special side deal. The goal was to change the criminal code to allow for a deferred prosecution agreement under which a company like SNC-Lavalin would pay fines but escape criminal conviction and a 10-year ban from federal contracts. We have a good reputation for delivering on the promises that we've made. It's because they like our honest and open approach. Monsieur le Président. SNC-Lavalin got its wish. Last year, the finance minister tabled a budget that changed Canadian law. Why does the finance minister think it's appropriate to amend the criminal code through a budget bill? We believe the approach to deferred prosecution agreements will enable us to pursue an approach that is functioning in other uh, economies. But changing the law was step one for SNC. Step two was getting a deferred prosecution agreement. And that's where Jody Wilson-Raybould comes in. In all of its lobbying on justice issues, SNC-Lavalin never once spoke to the justice minister. But the prime minister did. On September 17th, as parliament resumed and the company lobbied prosecutors for a deal, Trudeau says he reassured his attorney general. I told her directly that any decisions on matters uh, involving the director of public prosecutions uh, were hers alone. But the lobbying continued. The next day, SNC-Lavalin met with the clerk of the Privy Council and the finance minister to once again discuss justice issues. None of it seems to have paid off. In October, prosecutors told SNC-Lavalin there would be no deal. The criminal charges were going to court. Things started to move fast. The very next day, the company met with an official in Trudeau's office. A week later, the company announced it would challenge the prosecutor's decision. The Globe and Mail reports this is when Wilson-Raybould was pressured to intervene, an allegation the Prime Minister denies. In December, SNC-Lavalin issued a statement saying its Quebec operations were in doubt. In January, Wilson-Raybould was shuffled out of the justice portfolio. This week, she quit Cabinet entirely. Which brings us to now. It remains an unfinished story with many blank spaces and just one person who can help fill them in. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa.
A fraud and corruption conviction would bar SNC-Lavalin from bidding on federal work for some 10 years. But how much could that actually be? We thought one way to try and estimate would be to look at its government contracts over the past 10 years. We dug through government databases for a glimpse of what SNC stands to lose. Between 2009 and 2018, we found more than 900 contracts with federal departments worth a total of more than $2 billion. Now, that doesn't include major construction projects, which make up the bulk of the engineering giant's work. SNC says it has $8 billion worth of infrastructure projects planned right now. So the stakes for a company with 50,000 employees are high. Now, 3,400 of those employees work in Quebec, and that's where the global giant was founded a century ago. Alison Northcott talked to many there who see the story through a different lens. Just take a look at the Montreal skyline and you'll see SNC-Lavalin's work everywhere. The roof of the Olympic Stadium, the Mercier Bridge, the soon-to-be-completed Champlain Bridge. The engineering giant also owns part of the 407 toll highway near Toronto and built part of the SkyTrain system in Vancouver. The company's long history here, started by Francophone Quebecers, is a particular source of pride, with major projects like the Manic 5 Dam and the James Bay Hydroelectric Project. But there have been scandals, too. Allegations of fraud and bribery, including a bid-rigging scheme to build this $1.3 billion Montreal hospital. That this is an important player in the Quebec economy and in the Canadian economy. This Quebec radio host and political watcher says despite SNC-Lavalin's past problems with corruption, it remains an important economic driver. It's also... Uh, a success story, a major employer, a major uh, e partner in economic development. Uh, we don't have that many multinational co uh, companies that have a head office in Quebec. And the, the vast majority of the people who work there had nothing to do with corruption. It's why many Quebec pundits and politicians want the Trudeau government to allow the company to be sanctioned out of court. I'm not asking him not to punish, uh, punish uh, SNC-Lavalin. I'm just trying to say, can you settle as soon as possible in order that we keep the jobs? This columnist says giving the company a deal is not about pandering to Quebec, but about good public policy. The narrative seems to be that, uh, oh, here's another uh, Quebec uh, company involved in some corruption scheme and uh, that asks for you know the charity of, for the, uh, from the government and to uh, uh, to be saved and then uh, the government seems to be uh, trying to buy votes in Quebec Quebec's pension fund is SNC Lavalin's largest shareholder giving Quebecers a vested interest even if those shares are a small fraction of its holdings very good company the best that I work with and uh, Whatever's happening with them, it's only a few rotten apples. And it's why many here hope those few won't lead to everyone paying a price. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. So plenty for at issue to debate again tonight. Andrew Chantal and our national affairs editor, Chris Hall, will join us in about 20 minutes to dig into all that. But Andrew, there's something else coming down the pike to Ottawa right now. <laughs> yeah, Rosie, they're uh, fueled up, fed up and on the road. Talking about a convoy of trucks, about 160 of them begun a four-day journey from Red Deer, Alberta to Ottawa. Their beef with the federal government, the way it's handled the downturn in the oil industry, its handling of the economy, and what they see as its general lack of support for the West. The message they're taking to Parliament Hill is pretty straightforward. Get the pipelines built and get more oil flowing again. In a moment, we're going to hear from Aaron Collins, who's on the road with them. But Rafi Bujikanyan was there as the trucks rolled out, and he starts our coverage. Lord, I pray that oil would, uh, Lord, oil would flow through Alberta, would flow through Canada, God. The list of asks to a higher power is short. The list of grievances to the powers that be a little longer and a long time coming. Organizers started plotting the convoy's course to Ottawa weeks ago. Today, they were finally ready to set off. We got natural gas, we got oil, we're selling it for nothing. We, that's got to change. United We Rule wants pipelines built fast. It's also got issues with the federal Liberals' plan to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. We have to pay carbon tax on our bread, 
on our gas. And the group has managed to attract some who don't work in the oil industry too. Ralph Sinclair's auto parts store serves clients in the energy sector. He's been suffering since the downturn five years ago. Uh, in 2014, we ended up having to lay off uh, six people. But even before setting out, this convoy has veered into controversial territory. Some of its members identify with the Yellow Vest movement, which has staged several protests across Western Canada this winter. Some see their message as anti-immigration. We're not against immigration, legal immigration. Some pro-oil groups have distanced themselves from the Yellow Vests. But in this convoy, anyone can come along for the ride as long as they don't make hateful statements. And so, with 3,500 kilometers to cover, they're finally off. I'm Aaron Collins, and this is the view from the heart of a movement. The United We Roll convoy heading east. A moving movement, so big it has supporters without trucks tagging along for the ride. And thanks to Steve Bukowski, they have a ride too. The bus company owner donated more than half of the cost of this trip because he believes in the message it carries. All Canadians got to work together. We got to start streamlining some of the uh, uh, major projects that are on, that could be on board here, uh, whether it's pipelines, whether it's LNG plants, uh, whatever. We're not looking for handouts. Brian Barrett is along for the ride too, but he has a truck. Barrett from Red Deer used to be a consultant in the oil patch until the work dried up. Now he drives a truck to make ends meet. A familiar story in his neck of the woods. Hundreds, thousands of people lost their jobs, lost their homes, and uh, it's, been, it's been tough for, for the average Alberta worker because so much of the Alberta employment uh, depends upon the oil patch. Barrett and the rest of the drivers and passengers in this convoy are carrying a simple message with them to Ottawa. Canada's oil patch needs help and it needs it now. Aaron Collins, CBC News, heading east on the Trans-Canada. And one last footnote on this. If you're going to be in Ottawa next Tuesday and Wednesday, be warned that the city plans to close the roads around Parliament Hill both days to make way for all those trucks. Noted. I will walk to work that day. If there's a single issue that symbolizes Donald Trump's bond with his base, it's his wall along the U.S.-Mexican border. Trump has said he'll build it one way or another. Well, one way has been confrontation with Congress, the kind that a couple months ago led to the longest government shutdown in U.S. history. Well, today, Congress again refused to give Trump the money he wanted for his wall. So now he's trying the other way. Ellen Morrow explains. He's prepared to sign the bill. He will also be issuing a national emergency declaration at the same time. With that confirmation, President Trump is declaring a national emergency, freeing up funding for a border wall that was supposed to be paid for by Mexico. They don't know it yet, but they're going to pay for the wall. Unsurprisingly, immediate criticism. Declaring a national emergency would be a lawless act, a gross abuse of the power of the presidency Trump was asking for $5.7 billion for the wall. The bill from Congress today gave him just a fraction of that. So the president is taking matters into his own hands, sidestepping Congress and its constitutional control over spending. Nancy Pelosi asked Republicans how they'd like it if a Democrat did the same thing. If the president can declare an emergency on something that he has created as an emergency, an, an, an illusion that he wants to convey, just think of what a president with different values can present to the American people. It's a concern Republicans are heeding. In a statement Marco Rubio wrote, no crisis justifies violating the Constitution. Today's national emergency is border security, but a future president may use this exact same tactic to impose the Green New Deal. Trump, too, once opposed the same tactics. In this 2014 tweet, writing Republicans must not allow President Obama to subvert the Constitution of the U.S. for his own benefit and because he is unable to negotiate with Congress. 
The president, though, has some backing. Senator Lindsey Graham tweeted, I stand firmly behind President Trump's decision to use executive powers to build the wall, barriers we desperately need. The declaration does not mean the wall is a done deal. Democrats will fight it in Congress and lawsuits could be filed. Cases that could end up at the Supreme Court. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Washington. And some other stories we're following tonight on The National. Lawyers for the federal government were in court today defending Ottawa's constitutional right to impose a price on carbon. One province's refusal or failure to sufficiently regulate greenhouse gas emissions impacts Canada as a whole. So this was day two of the legal proceedings. Saskatchewan, Ontario and New Brunswick argued yesterday that the government is overstepping its jurisdiction. We're expecting a decision in the next few months, but even then it'll likely be appealed. Special Counsel Robert Mueller has a new boss. Today, William Barr was confirmed as U.S. Attorney General. I will follow the Special Counsel regulations scrupulously and in good faith, and on my watch, Bob will be allowed to finish his work. That was Barr's Judiciary Committee hearing last month when lawmakers questioned whether he would interfere in the Russian probe. It's an important question because when that investigation is finished, it'll likely be Barr's decision how much of it is made public. And Michael Avenatti says he has damning evidence against R. Kelly. The high-profile lawyer says he's given prosecutors a VHS tape allegedly showing the singer having sex with an underage girl. Avenatti is representing a man he calls a whistleblower against Kelly. The singer has faced allegations of sexual misconduct involving minors for nearly two decades, but has never been convicted. Well, it's been a day of mourning in Parkland, Florida. One year ago, a gunman stormed the halls of Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School and opened fire. 14 students and three staff members were killed. More than a dozen others were hurt. We are calling a day of uh, service and love. Uh, to honor uh, the victims. Students didn't have to go to school today, but for those who did, a reminder, be positive, be passionate, be proud. And inside, they rolled up their sleeves and got down to work, serving breakfast to first responders and packing meals for kids in need. We're also grateful to still be here after the tragedy that happened last year. <laughs> Outside, a new memorial garden. It was planted by a teacher and student who saw the carnage firsthand. It's just so therapeutic to use your own hands, put the roots in the ground, watch it blossom and, and grow into something that, you know, these kids and adults, they can't do anymore. Other schools held their own emotional tributes. We should be learning and thinking about our tests, not about thinking that if we're going to get killed, the call for change shared by this Parkland mother. Look what happened in Sandy Hook. Look what happened in Columbine. And look, nothing's done. But nothing's going to get done unless we do it. So, Rosie, you know, it's, um, it's staggering to, to think of the gun violence statistics, right? And, and to look at them and feel like you're facing headwinds. Those students must be feeling that way. Uh, one thing to note, there have been some changes in the last year. 26 states have passed new laws aimed at curbing gun violence, so there is progress there. Yeah, it does seem to be happening primarily at the state level, although Democrats are, are moving a little bit to try and uh, do better background checks, so that too uh, may happen at the federal level, but it is a slow going in that country for mm -hmm. sure. Still ahead on The National, it's at issue night. There's kind of a lot to talk about this week. Chantel, Andrew and Chris Hall are here to break down all the latest in the SNC-Lavalin affair. Plus, as coalition forces back ISIS into a corner, fighters who flock to Syria from around the world are going home. What does that mean for Canada? And a violent week of protests and crackdowns in Haiti. An update on what's happening on the ground and the Canadian aid workers who are stuck there. How does it feel to hear the situation that he's in and be here while he's there? The only word I could think of is panic. It's panic because you're here. You know they're in danger. There's not much we could do except for trying to get our connections to, um, to, help, to help them out.
Violent protests in Haiti have stranded more than 100 Canadians who would risk their lives just trying to reach the airport. Public outrage has simmered for months over billions of dollars missing from the Treasury, and in the last week, it boiled over. <laughs> this protester calls the president a thief and says if Jovenel Moïse doesn't go, they will burn the country down. In the capital, rampant looting by those who say the government stole from them. Basics like food, fuel and water are now in short supply. Today, Canada closed its embassy, though consular staff remain in Haiti to help Canadians. Two days ago, Global Affairs Canada updated its travel advice. We advise against all non-essential travel to the country, it said. Late tonight, Global Affairs raised the alert higher, avoid all travel, and people should consider leaving by commercial means while they are available. But it's all scant help for Canadians already there. The CBC's Jacqueline Hansen looks at what they're going through and how loved ones back home are coping. Uh, this picture of the team here. Yeah. Josette Bazil's dad goes to Haiti several times every year to offer desperately needed medical services and supplies. But he's never been there at a time like this. What worries me is more the panic. Um, he, my dad doesn't usually panic, and he has this panic in his voice. That, that worries me. He took another Canadian doctor and nurses with him to help. So I have to keep the moral high. I'm a physician. Uh, so there's that, but inside I don't sleep. Fire, debris, and thousands of people are blocking the streets through Port-au-Prince. The riots have cut off access to the international airport. Dr. Bazil and his team are staying outside the capital. So is a separate group of eight Canadian nurses. They were supposed to return home yesterday. So we're rationing. We're rationing our food. We're rationing. We're turning the generator off because there's no fuel. Tracy Hada says her group is safe in a guarded compound. But she wishes Canadian officials had been more proactive. It would have been nice to know how things were escalating before it actually came to the point where we could not get out. About 100 tourists from Quebec are also trapped at a resort near Port-au-Prince. Terry Watson is one of them. Every day we try to find out if there's possibility for us to leave the country, but nobody says anything except stay in the hotel because it's too dangerous to go up. Do you think you'll be safe to leave tonight? Dr. Bazil is going to try to get his team out tonight. That really makes me nervous because they're taking a chance. Um, they're taking a chance that people will be, there will be no riots. They're taking a chance that everybody will be sleeping. So, of course, it, it makes me nervous. It's scary. His daughter left to wait what feels like a world away to find out if he really is coming home. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Toronto. Next on The National, at issue. Chantal, Andrew and Chris Hall on what's next in the SNC-Level affair. You don't want to miss it. Plus, giving all new meaning to the phrase Netflix and chill. <laughs> <laughs> meet the, all right, meet the Romeo who built a cozy igloo for his Juliet this Valentine. I grabbed a snow shovel and like, you have any bottles of wine? She's got a whole rack of them. <laughs> she handed us two. She's like, go enjoy yourself. So. Welcome back. A few stories we're working, watching tonight on The National. In a dramatic reversal, Amazon has cancelled plans to build a new headquarters in New York. The project would have brought 25,000 jobs to the city, but there was local backlash over the tax breaks the company was offered. They would have amounted to nearly $3 billion. News for Amazon is that they're not bigger than New York City, at least not yet. And on going back to the drawing board, finding an alternate city, Amazon says not interested at this time. Well, I ask because it warms you up. It's not that easy, but it's Saskatoon. You got to get used to it, I guess. Boy, Saskatchewan is going through one of its coldest Februarys in recent memory. Saskatoon, in particular, it's had 10 days now with temperatures below minus 20. The last time that happened was 1939. An extreme cold warning is still in effect there tonight, so bundle up. Uh, also, parts of Alberta feeling the same thing. And snowfall warnings are back in place for BC's south coast. Up to 15 centimeters expected in some parts tonight. But tomorrow could all turn to slush, making for messy roads. Environment Canada says the weather's going to warm up.
if she felt that she had received pressure, uh, it was her obligation, her responsibility to come uh, to talk to me, and she did not do that in the fall. And now he's trying to paint himself as the victim in all of this. I don't think Canadians are buying that. We don't have the mechanisms to go through the fishing expedition and the kind of witch hunt that the Conservatives would like to see. To the comment that we're here to try to embarrass the Prime Minister, he's doing that all on his own. He has used his power a privilege to silence her. Hard to believe it's only been one week since the Globe and Mail first reported those allegations that the Prime Minister's office allegedly in some way pressured Jody Wilson-Raybould. Since then, the former AG has kept very silent and the Justice Minister has now, Justice Committee rather, has now limited who it will hear from. So for a government all about openness and transparency, are there consequences here for the Liberal brand? At issue is back because it's just been one of those weeks. Chantal Hébert is in Montreal. Andrew Coyne is in Toronto and Chris Hall joins us tonight here in Ottawa. Okay, let, let's start where we left off in that little clip montage of what happened at that Justice Committee uh, meeting yesterday. I mean, I didn't certainly didn't watch that with great expectations, <laughs> but what do you make of how uh, the Liberal government moved to limit who we would hear from? I'll start with you on this, Andrew. Well, you say advisedly the Liberal government, supposedly committees are freestanding, but um, I think we saw once again how, what a fiction that is. Uh, it was a pretty disgraceful performance. Uh, I suppose it was the fix was always in. They were going to find some way to shut down any kind of investigation on this. But to do so in the way they did, by pretending to have an investigation, where the only witnesses you call are the ones that have nothing to do with it, and where you don't actually investigate the issue at hand, but you investigate some of the sort of uh, larger philosophical questions, um, it was a sham through and through. And it, uh, unfortunately, that is a, a fairly accurate view of Canadian politics, that we have very weak institutional mechanisms for holding governments to account. So was it the right move, Chantal? You know, if, if the government's trying to move on from this story, was that the way to handle it? There was no moving on from the story until uh, Jody Wilson-Raybould talked or says she's never going to talk forever. Mm -hmm. So this couldn't have been a way to um, shut down the story. It's going to only keep going, if only because then it moves on to the Senate, where you saw today senators who are uh, indigenous came out in support of Jody mm -hmm. Wilson-Raybould. There will be interest in the upper house in this story. But I did, did learn two things from what I saw yesterday. The first is that so far uh, the prime minister seems to have convinced most of his caucus to stay in line on this and to uh, support his take on whatever happened. Mm -hmm. And uh, two, I think the Liberals up to a point are buying time because at the end of the day, they probably believe they're going to hear from Jody Wilson-Raybould. They probably figure that they have no interest in saying anything before they hear what she has to say. That, I mean, that, that's, that's Rosie, probably fair. Yeah, go ahead, Chris. I, I'm personally delighted by the thought of reviewing the Shaw Cross doctrine uh, <laughs> and uh, and all sorts of arcane things about a law that's already been passed as the last page of a multi-hundred-page budget bill. But to the, to the broader point here, you know, Chantel raises an interesting question. We are waiting to see what Jody Wilson-Raybould ultimately says. The suggestion that she can't appear before the committee when she has a lawyer by the name of Thomas Cromwell, a retired Supreme Court justice, and is a lawyer herself, I'm pretty sure, as some of the opposition members were saying, that she would know what she could say and not say publicly uh, without violating the solicitor client privilege. That's not number one. Number two, they really haven't uh, said what other witnesses they're willing to add, but there are people who have direct knowledge who have been lobbied extensively by SNC Lavalin since this whole thing began uh, when they were rejected, and even before they were rejected for a plea bargain arrangement by the director of public prosecution. So there is an opportunity here to. to to rethink this behind closed doors on Tuesday. I know Andrew doesn't like that, but if you're going to come up with witnesses and you're going to understand what the breadth of this study is, they do have one more opportunity on Tuesday to get this right. Okay, except uh, let's turn to, to some of the brand issues around the government, as I mentioned, a government that has talked a lot about openness and transparency. So to move and to limit uh, the scope of a committee, to move it in camera, to try and uh, stop Jody Wilson-Raybould from talking in any way. I mean, I mean, what, what kind of damage is being done to that notion, given what we've seen over the past few days? It's uh, too early to tell, seriously. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And to, to your point of trying to stop Jody Wilson-Raybould from speaking, seriously, uh, once she gets 
a, a legal framework that tells her from the person she is paying for uh, what she can say and what she cannot say. She can come and say it to you. She can come out and write it uh, and put it out there. One way or another, uh, the fact that the committee is not going to call her in is yes. not going to stop her from giving or taking. Yeah. So, th so how much worse does it get then, Andrew, if, if we're all presuming, and I think the Prime Minister's office too, that Jody Wilson-Raybould has things to say, is going to figure out what she can and cannot say, and is going to say them, how much worse is this going to get? Well, potentially much worse. I mean, she would not have resigned, I think Chantel's made this point, if, if, uh, if she and the Prime Minister were anywhere near on the same page on what was said, to whom, by whom, etc. Uh, we could hear, you know, any day, to, to, we could hear tomorrow from the Prime Minister if he chose to, or from Jerry Brutz, his Principal Secretary, or the other officials in the Prime Minister, we could hear their side, but they choose right now uh, to simply brief people off the record behind the scenes. So, some, you know, it's not just Jody Wilson-Raybould we're waiting to hear about it. But it, you know, to come back to your previous question about what damage does this do to the, the Liberal brand, well, they came in on a, on a supposedly we're going to have a more ethical government. They could not look more like they have something to hide if they tried in the last few days. They were supposedly more feminist, more uh, in, interested in indigenous reconciliation. Those two are severely damaged. They weren't going to have omnibus bills. Well, the, the provision at the center of all this was slipped into the back pages of an omnibus bill. They have trampled over everything on which they supposedly stood for, and it's all coming back to bite them. But, but, but is it strange that for now we have not heard people speaking up? I, I, I mean, we, we called a lot of people yesterday to try and get people to say uh, something about how they felt. And there were not a, a, a large number of, of caucus members who were questioning things. I mean, they felt uh, downtrodden, certainly, but not, uh, but not ready to, to denounce anybody and certainly not at a point where they don't believe the prime minister. Chris, you want to weigh in on that? Yeah, I talked to a number of uh, longer standing liberal MPs who can remember the days of Jean Chrétien and Paul Martin when caucus was a more freewheeling place to express your concerns and your ideas and to tell the government where you thought they were misstepping. That doesn't happen anymore in large part, these people say, because Jerry Butts and Katie Telford, the two most powerful people in the prime minister's office, attend caucus. They're not MPs, but they're there anyway. So people, especially the rookies and the, and the people who haven't been around as long, are quite worried about it. The one other thing that comes out of this, uh, Rosie, we've seen Wayne Long, who's a St. John MP, who spoke out against the small business tax, is saying he believes there should be an inquiry. I don't know if he's speaking for a lot of people, but there is a sentiment there that the longer this waits, the more damaging it becomes, particularly if, if Jody Wilson-Raybould gets the chance to speak, and we all think that she probably will, it becomes more and more problematic as if, if her speaking uh, time comes closer to the election campaign, sure. it'll be fresher in voters' minds. The women who uh, voted for this government last time, uh, indigenous groups who saw a real path to reconciliation, this will become more of an issue for them the longer it takes for her to be able to speak. Chantal. But at the end of the day, if you are the PMO and you're assuming that she will speak, a reasonable assumption, apparently, um, you probably do not want to put your take on the, the yes, issue out there until or and give her more material to cut you off at the I cost. I kind of think they are, he already, the Prime Minister has already said a lot of things. He shifted the blame to her uh, this week. Yes, but uh, as Andrew rightly points out, there are others that uh, people will want to hear from and that will probably come up uh, in the wash if she does speak. So. Uh, I think they figure they're better off waiting to see how much damage they need to control. I did note also that between the prime minister suddenly throwing her under the bus, and I think that is how it came across, and today when suddenly the PMO is saying it's terrible that some people are anonymously saying bad things about her, there seems to be a new shift in the PMO strategy. So maybe we'll see six or seven more before this is done. I, I, Andrew, what, uh, how does this, oh, this is a terrible question to ask anybody, but how, how does it oh. end? Like, if you're a Canadian watching this at home and you're trying to understand what this is about and, and what happened here, how do you look at this and think, okay, well, we'll get these answers this day, or someone will investigate and get to the bottom of this, or I will know, uh, you know, in a month's time, what really happened and why it matters? Should, should we hold out any hope about that at all? Uh, not a great deal. The pattern in these things in Canada is, again, as I say, because we have so few actual institutional mechanisms to hold people to account, uh, they have so many ways of having convenient memory loss, et cetera, 
that I think the more, the more usual pattern is it, it dissolves in a haze of one person says one thing, one person yeah. says another thing, yeah. on the specific question of who said what to whom in the, in the Prime Minister's office. There's a lot of other questions to, to do with why this provision was put in the law in the first place, whether SNC Lavalin is actually eligible for the thing itself because they haven't actually met the conditions that are required mm -hmm. for it. There's a lot of other questions that I think can be addressed and can be answered, but who said what to whom, uh, we'll see. I, I don't hold out a lot of hope. Can I add just one last thing, Rosie? I, I, I think that uh, two things that we haven't really had an answer to. Uh, one is why was Jody Wilson-Raybould shuffled out of justice in the first place? Because that really is where this all goes back to. Uh, and secondly, the Prime Minister felt compelled to speak to her in September to reassure her that a decision on prosecution was hers and hers alone. That was before they even knew what the, Department, uh, the, the, the Director of Public Prosecutions was going to say about whether SNC-Lavalin qualified for this deal. So there are still many unanswered questions on this that really go to the heart of why Jody Wilson Rabel's no longer in cabinet today. And it's an odd thing to have to say. Uh, last word to you, Chantal, on that. Yes, well, we're assuming that uh, he talked in September with Jody Wilson Rabel to reassure her, but we don't know that. Uh, he could have made a case for her to intervene uh, even before the public prosecutor came to a decision. Uh, and at the end said, but of course it's your decision. We don't, we don't have the context for yeah. this reassurance of the prime minister, so how can we judge? That's right. Okay, uh, well, we raised lots more questions that I need answers to, but I appreciate it. Before we go, uh, thanks, everybody. We, be sure to subscribe to At Issue, the podcast, for extra content. This week, we're talking about Saskatchewan's carbon tax challenge. Look for it on iTunes, any major podcast app, our website, cbcnews.ca slash the national. Well, today, superstar musician Sting met with some of the 2,500 GM workers facing layoffs in Oshawa, Ontario. They're going through the same sort of ordeal portrayed in his musical, The Last Ship. And Sting discussed that with our senior correspondent, Susan Ormiston, in an interview that you can watch here next week. I am feeling that Ontario will uh, respond to this play. Why? I think the themes of the play are resonant with the, a, a world situation, you know, where people are losing their jobs to automation or to abstract economic theories that uh, excise the value of community. And that, that's happening everywhere. It's happening in the Midwest of America. I know it's happening here. GM, GM. in Oshawa. So the themes of the play are, you know, very topical. The show kicks off tomorrow in Toronto, telling the story of proud British shipyard workers about to lose their livelihoods. You know, you have a, the dignity of your work, the pride of your work, who you are. You are what you do. That's one of the lines of Francis says in the play. You, know, you are what you do. You take that away, what are you? Something the Oshawa workers won't soon forget. A year has passed since I wrote my notes. I should have known this right from the start. Only hope can keep me together. This security cam footage shows three British teenagers in a Turkish bus station bound for Syria to join ISIS. Nearly four years later, one of them, Shamima Begum, has already lost two children to malnutrition and disease. Pregnant, she's now in a camp in Kurdish-controlled Syria and told the Times newspaper she wants to go home. I'm scared that this baby's gonna get sick in this camp. That's why I really wanna get back to Britain, because I know it will be taken care of. She's not alone. There are thousands of captured foreign ISIS fighters, their wives and children in these camps, including Canadians. ISIS's so-called caliphate has collapsed. Those who left their home countries to join it are now citizens of purgatory. So what happens to the Canadians among them? Diana Swain has been digging into that. There are those who continue to fight, perhaps hoping for either a miracle or martyrdom. But ISIS' hold on Syria has shrunk to scattered pockets of land. As many as 5,000 ISIS fighters and their families are now being held in makeshift prisons in the desert. Some were captured, some surrendered. Many are children who were born into this. CBC News has determined as many as 32 of them are Canadian, such as Mohammed Abdullah Mohammed of Toronto, 
who says he was captured in a battle in January. I was captured by them after uh, attacking one of their points. Mohammed Ali from Mississauga, who was captured several months ago, and these two women reportedly from Ontario and Alberta, who along with their children gave themselves up last week. The Syrian Democratic Forces have them now. It's the U.S.-backed group of Kurdish fighters who've been battling ISIS. It wants other countries to repatriate their citizens. France has already started moving back dozens of people to be prosecuted at home. We've heard the request. Canada's public safety minister said last week he won't be pressured into a decision. The fact of the matter remains that is a dangerous and dysfunctional part of the world. What remains, too, is the fact that bringing them back presents its own problems. Canada has made it illegal to go abroad to join a terrorist group, but prosecutors will still need to prove their case. Canada has been working with its Five Eyes partners, the U.S., Britain, New Zealand and Australia, to share what evidence they have. But evidence that can be used in a courtroom is often very difficult to get, particularly when it must be derived from a foreign war zone half a world away. Lauren Waldman is an immigration lawyer in Toronto. He says evidence gathered in a battlefield could be easily challenged in court, and just proving someone was in Syria won't be enough. They can't be examined by immigration officers at, at the border when they come in. They have a right to enter, and there's no legal right for the Canadian government to, to question them, or nor are, there, are they under any obligation to answer any questions. Christian Loiprecht is an expert in international security. He believes Canada squandered an opportunity to toughen its laws and make it easier to prosecute those who return. For years, uh, governments of both political stripes had the opportunity to anticipate uh, that we were going to find ourselves in this position and instead of doing that we just kind of hoped the issue would go away. But he points out many of the Canadians in custody right now are in fact children and their mothers and may be better candidates for reintegration. Yet just getting them back to Canada presents a different set of challenges. It's after all still a war zone. Loiprex suspects Canadian forces are already gaming out what it would take to escort the Canadians out of Syria. But imagine, he says, if a highly trained Canadian soldier is injured or killed trying to get a Canadian ISIS member to safety. I think we want to think very carefully about for what purposes we deploy um, our most highly trained military personnel. It raises the question, does Canada have to do anything? Some people would say they have a duty to give a passport and not to block, but that doesn't necessarily mean they have to, to pay for their ticket and all these other steps that might be necessary to get the people out. Unless, he says, they can prove that being left in the camps puts them in danger. The federal government insists it's reached no decision yet on how to proceed. Either way, a question that's been quietly building for years now appears to be demanding an answer. Diana Swain, CBC News, Toronto. The recent decision from the U.S. to withdraw forces from Syria has raised concerns about the ability of Kurdish troops to maintain those camps. That's pushed countries to take back their citizens. Beyond France, Kazakhstan, Tunisia, Oman and Saudi Arabia have already repa repatriated rather ISIS captives or have plans to do so. A reminder that you can also follow us on Instagram. We post exclusive content and pictures from our reporters and camera people around the world daily. Check us out at CBC The National. Ah, the magic of winter. A rare snowstorm in BC mixed in with the romance of Valentine's Day and Paul Lewis knew he had an opportunity to impress his girlfriend of two weeks. Her name is Julia and he built her an igloo. So it took four hours, a few glasses of wine and the finished product is our moment of the day. Uh, well, I am just started dating the girl and I just made her dinner and um, I'm just like, I'm going to make an igloo. She's like, all right. She wasn't into it. She, about six layers, 17 bricks per layer. And then and the dome roof was probably another 10. Just after about the third or fourth layer, she kind of got into it. And she would work the outside. I'd work the inside as we packed up all the little cracks and stuff. And 
we went down to go grab a bottle of wine, but everything, because of the snowstorm, everybody was shut down and closed. So my mom lived a couple blocks away and uh, we popped in there. I grabbed a snow shovel and like, do you have any bottles of wine? She's got a whole rack of them. <laughs> she handed us two. She's like, go enjoy yourselves. We finished about three in the morning. And they were like, hey, we should like have a sleep in here. So we made little shelves for our candles and we had the fire pit propane fireplace at the door. So the heat from that was coming right in here. It iced it up inside really nicely. It's hard. It's really hard. <laughs> it's pretty cool. So we every night we've been in here um, since then. That was Monday night. It's now Thursday. This is, will be night four. We were watching movies and watching videos, and I got put a little mat outside. We were dancing outside the other night with the music going in the snow. We don't get snow like this and last this long, so this is so rare, and what a neat way to do it, right? Just enjoy the snow. I mean, it's never never too old to be act like a kid and have fun, so. So um, I like Paul a lot. I, I, I will, don't. <laughs> I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> I will say I could build like an igloo condo at my house, but I, li I like Paul, but I have concerns that after two weeks of dating Julia, this is the bar that he has set himself. I just don't feel like he will be able to keep up this pace. Yeah, he set himself and all of mankind. Like that, that's, that's the actual problem. Right? Okay. So, so, okay, so here's the best bit, actually, okay? Uh, okay. So, so as you know, one of our producers, Eliza, uh, sent a, a note with an update on Paul's romantic adventure. And so she said, today, Lewis was going to surprise, Paul was going to surprise his girlfriend, Julia, with a snow polar bear. He sculpted a 10-foot bear out of snow. It was holding a giant heart, but it fell apart before he could finish. To which I say, thank goodness. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Perfect, not so perfect. <laughs> That's the Poor national. Paul. <laughs> That's the national for this Thursday, February 14th. Have a good night. Good night.